As anyone who's ever studied abstract algebra can tell you, one of the hardest things to do is to take something that's familiar and somehow make it less familiar by looking at what are the properties that characterize what we know and love about that familiar thing. So what am I talking about? So we all learn through the process of elementary, middle, and high school and some college, what are the properties of the rational numbers, for instance. The, the set of numbers that includes the integers, but it also includes any ratio of two integers as long as the denominator is not zero. And the rational numbers have a lot of really nice properties. We know how to add and subtract fractions. We know how to multiply and divide fractions. And moreover, we can do all of those things to any pair of rational numbers as long as we're not trying to divide by zero for some reason. Um, so the rational numbers have this whole rich arithmetic that we learn a lot about through the process of going up through the grades. And what we're interested in doing in abstract algebra at this point is taking the rational numbers that we know and love so well and looking at what other sets have that same kind of arithmetic. In what other situations can we add, subtract, multiply, and divide by everything as long as we're not trying to divide by zero, the additive identity. Those arithmetic systems are called fields. And in this next set of videos, we're going to first of all take a look at what is the definition of a field, and we're going to do that from kind of a little uh, twisted way, uh, if you will. We're going to look at it from a little bit more sophisticated perspective on whether or not multiplication is one to one, or whether or not multiplication is onto. Uh, and then after that, we're going to begin looking at some examples of fields which are not the rational numbers, the real numbers, and the complex numbers, because there's so much more to field theory than that. Um, so we're going to start by looking at examples of finite fields. How do we construct finite fields? Where do fields come from? And then what are some interesting examples of finite fields that are not simply the modular rings Z mod PZ? So that's where we're going to go with this whole thing. Again, first we're going to start by looking at what is a field? What is it that characterizes the properties of having all the arithmetic we can possibly have? What are some ways of constructing a field? In particular, how do we take a ring, let's say a commutative ring, uh, and make a field out of it through a process of taking a quotient? And then finally, we'll look at what is it that makes finite fields, so fields that have a finite number of elements, what makes them so interesting? And there is really a lot to say about finite fields, and we'll only get a chance to say some of it in our course. So there's more to it than just the rationals, the reals, and the complex numbers. Those are three fields that we know a lot about, um, but we're going to start the process of looking at some fields that we don't know a whole lot about yet. So again, here's the motivation. What we want is we want a system in which we can do all the arithmetic possible, that we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide as long as we're not trying to divide by zero. So just to put things into perspective, um, if we start by thinking about just addition, well, the natural numbers are a good setting in which to do addition. Um, the addition in the natural numbers is commutative, it's associative, and so the natural numbers form a semigroup. The reason it's a semigroup and not a group is that it doesn't necessarily have additive inverses. So if we do happen to have additive inverses and we have a notion of subtraction, then better than a semigroup, we actually have a group. Then in order to get more structure, we have to build an operation on top of this called multiplication. And that operation has to distribute over the first. So if I have a multiplication operation that distributes over addition and is associative, then I have a ring, as we know. If we insist that this operation also be commutative, then I have a commutative ring. And we do, for instance, in the integers, have a commutative ring. But then if I want inverses, in other words, I want to be able to divide by every non-zero element of my system, then I have something more. I have a division ring. And if we also include the commutativity hypothesis, we get something better than a division ring. We get a field. And so in a field, we have all four of these operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. They're all, uh, well, multiplication and addition are commutative. Uh, and multiplication distributes over addition. And we can divide by everything except 0. Of course, in the, the real numbers, for instance, we can go even higher than this. We can build on top of multiplication and division to get exponentiation and roots. And if we're able to do that in our field, then our field is going to be something special. We're going to call it algebraically close. We'll have a more rigorous definition of what that means uh, in the fullness of time. Um, but for now, the point is that what we really need when we need a field is we need multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction. We need to be able to do everything except divide by 0. So the idea, again, is that we want to take the properties that make the so-called number fields work 
and look at those properties. And when I say number fields, what I mean here are subfields of the complex numbers with the usual operations of addition and multiplication. So for instance, the rational numbers and the real numbers are number fields. But one of the more interesting places we're going to go with this discussion is to look at what are some other number fields that could make our lives interesting or useful. So for instance, what is there in between the rational numbers and the real numbers that is also a subfield of the complex numbers? So again, the definition of a field is that a field is a commutative division ring. In other words, we have addition that's commutative, um, and we have multiplication that's commutative, and we also have inverses for both of those operations um, in which we can divide by everything except for 0. But let's take a different perspective on it. Let's think about what field means from the point of view of looking at multiplication maps. So let's think about the integers for a second, and think about the function f of n is equal to 3n. So I'm going to call that the multiplication by 3 function. And I want to ask the question, is this operation 1 to 1, and is this operation on to? So just to get a picture of this. What we're going to do is think about multiplying every one of the integers by 3, and asking whether or not the correspondence that that sets up is a 1 to 1 correspondence, whether it's 1 to 1, whether it's on to. So for instance, 0 goes to 0, 1 goes to 3, 2 goes to 6, and so forth and so forth. So is this a 1 to 1 function? In other words, if I have two uh, numbers, n and m, two integers, uh, then if their images are the same, if 3n is equal to 3m, then is it true that n is equal to m? Well, sure, we can cancel the 3. Uh, one of the ways of proving that is to observe that multiplication by 3 is an order-preserving function. And we can use the properties of ordered sets to justify why this is, in fact, 1 to 1. So f is indeed a 1 to 1 function. Now what that means for our algebraic structure is that if I somehow can divide a number by 3, then the answer that I get when I divide by 3 is going to be unique. For instance, 12, we know we can divide by 3. Um, and following the arrow backwards from the bottom row to the top row, we find that 12 divided by 3 is equal to 4 because f of 4 is equal to 12 in this example. So if I can divide, then my answer is going to be unique, that 12 divided by 3 can't take on two different values because this multiplication by 3 is 1 to 1. So what about onto? So is it true that if I pick any old integer, that that n is equal to f of a for some other integer a? In other words, is every n equal to 3 times a for some integer a? Well, that's definitely not true. We can take an integer like 7 and just observe that 7 is not, in fact, equal to 3 times a for any a. Uh, it would be something in between 2 and 3, but there is nothing in between 2 and 3. So this is not an onto function. So we know, based on the 1 to 1 property, that if we can divide a number by 3, then the answer that we get is unique. But because the multiplication by 3 function is not onto, we cannot, in fact, always divide every integer by 3. This is not news, right? There are a lot of integers that are not multiples of 3. But we're looking at it here from the point of view of the multiplication by 3 function being 1 to 1, so the division is unique, but not onto, so division is not always possible. So here's a theorem for you. That looking at the 1 to 1-ness and onto-ness of multiplication maps can actually tell us when a commutative ring is a field. So a commutative ring is a field if and only if, if I pick any non-zero member of that ring, let's call it c, then the multiplication by c function, f of r is equal to c times r, has got to be, in order for this ring to be a field, a bijection. In other words, that multiplication has to be 1 to 1, so that it's always going to give us a unique answer when we divide by c, but that that multiplication also has to be onto, so that division by c is always possible, that we can divide every uh, member of this ring by c. In other words, that's just saying uh, that c has a multiplicative inverse. So every c, except for e c is equal to 0, will have to be a unit. We know that to be uh, another definition of what it means to be a division ring. And since our ring is commutative, that makes it a field. So just as an example, if we look at the rational numbers, uh, we look at the multiplication by negative 2 function on the rational numbers. Well, it's going to associate to every rational number like 17 fourteenths its uh, product by negative 2, in this case, negative 17 over 7. And this is a 1 to 1 multiplication, but it's also onto. I can multiply every rational number by negative 2, but I can also divide every rational number by negative 2 and get another rational number. So the rationals are this prototype of a field in which we can do all the arithmetic we could ever need to do. 
And the rational numbers are, in fact, an example of what's called a field of fractions. This is not a construction that we're going to use very much, but I wanted to expose you to it really quickly to show that it's something a little bit more general than we see in just the rational numbers. So the definition of the field of fractions of an integral domain is it's a set of equivalence classes, p comma q, uh, where q is not equal to 0. And we define two of these equivalence classes to be equivalent. Sorry, we define two of these elements to be equivalent if the product of the first entry of one with the second entry of the other is equal to the product of the second entry of the first times the first entry of the second. In other words, the so-called cross products are equal. So where does this definition come from? The motivation, of course, is the motivation of how we build the rational numbers out of the integers. So if our ring happens to be z, then the equivalence class of p comma q is what we mean when we write down the fraction p divided by q. And it works again because then two fractions are equivalent if their cross products are equal. So for example, we have a fraction like 5 over 20. And that fraction actually is just one member of a whole equivalence class of ordered pairs. For instance, 5 comma 20 and 1 comma 4. Those are in the same equivalence class because their cross products are equal. They're both equal to 20. And this set is really the set of all fractions, equivalence classes, that are equivalent to 5 over 20. It includes infinitely many different representatives. Um, so we can pick one of them if we want to, for instance, 1 fourth, which would be the lowest terms representative. Um, but that's the reason that sort of the rational numbers, or the field of fractions in general, are really built out of equivalence classes and not individual elements, because we have a whole bunch of different fractions, if you will, uh, that are all treated exactly the same way. And then on top of this set of equivalence classes, we also set down the operations of addition and multiplication that we have to define carefully. So we know how to define the addition of two fractions just by throwing in a common denominator and then um, adding across the numerators once we've given both of those fractions that common denominator. And this is a well-defined operation because our new denominator, q times s, is not equal to 0 because after all, r was thought to be an integral domain here. So we can't have any 0 divisors. So qs, this denominator, is never 0, which is good. We definitely want that. And then we also have the operation of multiplication that's defined in the usual way that we multiply across the numerators and we multiply across the denominators. So in fact, any integral domain can be made into a field of fractions just by setting up this particular kind of equivalence. Uh, and when we do that with the integers, we get the rational numbers that we know and love. But of course, we could do it with other integral domains if we want to. And we may do so later on in the course.